Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Savvy Cast. This is Jamie, and I'm so thrilled that you're here today, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast. Okay, I'm joined today by repeat guests, my daughter, Ellie Hiller, and her friend and my friend and her fellow fitness coach, Gina Pitts. And they are going to help not only me, but anyone out there who might need to make some change, lifestyle changes to get on a better track. Ladies, thank you for being here today. I know you're both busy and I appreciate it. We're so excited. Yeah, so excited to be here. Okay, since y'all have been here myriad times, I'm not going to make you answer the last meal question. We're going to dive right in. Since you are here, you have officially launched a course and can you briefly explain what is in that course for those who might be interested? I'll briefly explain. Our course is called Midlife Savvy, and it's an all-inclusive one-stop shop for the midlife woman specifically, but a lot of what we include really just applies to everyone. But we go over nutrition, lifestyle habits, and fitness for the mid specific to the midlife woman. So we have educational videos, we have quizzes to reinforce the knowledge that you learn, and it's all in one place, right? Like you can read books about nutrition, read books about lifestyle, all that. But we decided to just condense it down so that you can make your way through the course and get everything you need to know so you can start implementing it. Now, if a he, man wants to take it, can he? For sure. Right. Like he definitely can, but it, it's really geared towards the midlife woman because we include the evidence. Well, actually, it's completely geared towards the midlife woman. <laughs> we 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 give the evidence-based recommendations for strength training. We provide Gina created a blueprint, a four-week strength training protocol to show a woman what that might look like. Instead of saying, hey, go strength train three days a week, we show them exactly what that would look like and give them a plan to follow for four weeks. So oh, that's wonderful. Well, yeah. I'm dabbling in it. I'm actually taking it when I off and on, which is the beauty is that you don't have to sit down and do it. If you're busy, like we all are, you can take it, listen, watch, work at your pace. Um, ladies, what I need you all to help me with today, and my Instagram followers already know this, but two weeks ago, I went Zane and I used to be the same doctor, and we've had him for years, and every year before our annual, we get the Cleveland Clinic lab work, the total lab work that tells everything. He also gets the calcium tests, which that was good, which is great, but he came back with some very unsettling news. And his, he had his sheets with him. His, our doctor said, Zane, you are pre-diabetic. His blood work was just red all over because he had already had some issues with his lipids and triglycerides. So the first thing I did was, okay, let me call Ellie. And the two of you are going to join um, me today on the podcast to share the lifestyle changes that I need to help Zane make, and of course, I'll follow them too, to get on a healthy track where maybe this issue will go away. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm trying to pull up exactly what my dad's A1C was to kind of just give people um, a little bit of context. Not that that's necessary, but let's go ahead and just define prediabetes versus like diabetes, just because I think that's like important. Um, and Gina, just interrupt me when you want to. But number one, we're not trying to treat anything. We're not registered dietitians. So we're not treating a medical diagnosis, right? But with prediabetes and diabetes, that's type two, which is what my dad's blood work came back to be as pre-diabetic with type two, which is related to lifestyle. This sounds harsh, but the way I would phrase it is someone who, like my dad, in my dad's instance, this is a, a lot of a result of choices that, you know, he made, right? It's not, you don't inherit this. And I'm not trying to be that say that in a rude way. It's just kind of the nature of the beast with our food culture and our food environment. It's an uphill battle. It's really hard for us to, to eat really healthy. So I'm not saying it's entirely his fault, but I think it's important to differentiate that this type of blood sugar issue is related to how you eat. Paul T, Zane's dad, got the same diagnosis last week. Really? He sure did. And interestingly, mm -hmm. you mentioned A1C. Mm -hmm. Your dad's A1C was higher than Paul T's. I think dad's was like 6.1. Paul T's was a little better. 
Yeah. And mm -hmm. like for reference, um, 5.7 is going to be a, typically like a average person's A1C who doesn't have prediabetes. And then let's, de let's define A1C. That's essentially over the course of three months, your average blood sugar. You can do more research into this, but it, it's really just over the course of three months. If, cause if you were to take your blood sugar at one time, that's going to change after, if I ate a piece of watermelon, my blood sugar is going to be high, but that doesn't, we, we need a longer period of time to know mm -hmm. if it's a problem or not. So I think where we need to start is what kind of like can lead to this, maybe like the types of food that are a problem. And then how we can kind of talk about lifestyle changes that can help really help someone get this under control with, with just simply lifestyle changes. So Gina, anything you want to say before we dive in, or do you want to go ahead and start with things that can kind of like cause high blood sugar over a long period of time? No, I think that was perfect. Ellie just kind of segueing like, this is a result of choices that you've made over time and that blood sugar does if I know uh, the big trend is continuous glucose monitors. So if you have that and you are identifying trends in what your glucose is doing throughout the day, you will notice it spikes based on different foods you eat. That is a natural thing. So if people are talking about, you know, they're gaining weight because their blood sugar spiking and it goes back to insulin, that's that's not really true. But we also don't want to stay with these huge spikes of glucose throughout the day where it never comes back down. So if you just, like you said, Ellie, if you see a spike after you eat a carb filled food, that's normal, but we don't want to see just like a spike that lasts all day long. That is not normal. So you'll notice based on what you eat, it'll be like hills up and down, up and down. And that's normal. So the HbA1c is, is what we want to look at when we're trying to identify if someone is pre-diabetic or diabetic. You know, would you all recommend a CGM just to sort of assess what, where you're at? I, I would say no, but that's only because I feel like that's getting really into the weeds when people probably need to start with the basics. Okay. So if you're not nailing the okay. basics consistently, it's like picking something that's super finite to grasp onto. That's really not the root of the issue. It can Perfect. be helpful for some people to get that feedback, but for most people, there's things that you can do that are lower hanging fruit. That's easier. perfect. That makes like, here's, sense. here's what I want to start out with, and then we'll we'll segue into the nutrition part. But I have had many clients have a lot of success with lifestyle changes that have prediabetes or even diabetes. And again, I can't, I'm not a registered dietitian, so I can't treat anything other than lifestyle changes. So I have one client specifically, his testimonial is on our Instagram page. He is outstanding. He um, has diabetes and his A1C when he started was 8.7. Okay. That's very high. All we did was focus on his uh, a, a consistent regimen for fitness. And then we used the plate method, which is helping him identify, all right, you know, one carb on the plate, an adequate amount of protein, and then, you know, a veggie at each meal. And he cut out sodas completely because he was drinking a soda like every single day. And he reduced his A1C from 8.7 to 6.03, which for those that don't know, wow. is, a, is a decrease of his average blood sugar by 77 points. That That's is my thing. insane. And he told me like, he, he would go to his doctor and his doctor was like, stop coming to me this often. Like whatever you were doing is, is amazing. And he was like, all I'm doing is eating more protein and vegetables and cutting out processed sugar. So was it all dietary Ellie or was he also, or he already worked out, obviously. He was doing CrossFit about three days a week. And that's just, I think a test or actually probably more about five days per week, but it's a testament to the fact that like with something like this, it, it's what really what you eat. Like, mm -hmm. you know, working out is amazing and it helps so much. Much, but if you don't change your nutrition, I mean, that's the root yeah. of the problem. Yeah. So I just want to start with that as an encouragement of like, you can make progress. Um, so we'll start with that. And then let's go ahead and start with like the, let's define Gina and I'll let you do this. What is the difference between when we say like processed sugar and then sugar and carbs that are, you know, whole foods and why do we not eliminate carbs completely with someone like my dad is, do we need to eliminate carbs completely? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think most people would be able to identify a processed sugar or a processed food in our current and modern food environment because it's so predominant. So thinking about like packaged foods or very hyper palatable foods, foods that you have a really difficult time stopping eating, right? Like once you start, it's really difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. Anything like that, that you're opening up a package and eating it, that's a refined sugar so that they're adding sugar in. If you ever look at a nutrition label, 
there will be multiple components underneath carbohydrates. So it'll say total carbs, and then it will be broken down in some different things. It'll say sugar. And then underneath sugar, there'll be another category that says included sugars. So if there are added sugars into a product, that is where you can identify that number right there. Because for example, fruit has sugar in it. Fruit doesn't have a food label, but if it did, there would be no included sugar. Yes. But something like a Pop-Tart, there's sugar in it, but it's because it's been added into that food. So that's a very highly processed food. And so I think we all can go into a store and, and see the aisles just littered with different foods that are packaged, highly processed, have lots of added sugars. But also, if you look at those, there's also lots of fat in them also. So it's not just the sugar. It's kind of the combination of the fat, sugar, and salt that make them very difficult to stop eating versus like piece of fruit or even like dates or other things like that that have quite a bit of sugar in them, but it's all in the food naturally. Great difference. I, I love that distinction because I think it's important. Mom, I think you might have even even insinuated that dad might need to like cut out carbs completely and you didn't know, but it's yeah. like, does he have to cut fruit out completely? No, but there's strategies that he would need to, to put in place. Like for example, you don't want to eat a carb in isolation, right? So if dad eats a banana, for example, that's going to, it's a, it's a whole food. It's not processed sugar. So it's fine. But if he eats it alone, his blood sugar is going to shoot up and then 15 minutes later, it's going to crash. So the key and the name of the game is to pair that carb with a protein source. Because what protein does is it stabilizes your blood sugar to where it takes longer for your body to digest those sugars, which is the which is what we want. Same thing with fiber. Can you pair it with fiber instead? Because a banana with protein doesn't sound that great, but banana with fiber. I mean, does it matter which one of those? So, so fiber is going to do the same thing. It slows down digestion, right? Ideally, unless you're about to go work out, there's really no, in my opinion, there's no reason to just eat a banana alone. Even if you're eating it with some fiber, I would always tell people, I bring them back to like, what's the point of this snack? It's to keep you full, right? We, we don't want to just eat to, to eat. The point of eating is so that we don't, we're not hungry again for a while. So if you eat a banana, even with a source of fiber, I mean, berries have fiber, right? Um, beans, like it's, I'm trying to think of a fiber source you would pair with a banana. You know, a bran you, muffin. Yeah, like a bran muffin. Like, yeah, it's going to lower your blood sugar, but it's kind of like, we want protein to keep you full for longer. Okay. So that's kind of well and I was gonna say like for fruit specifically like you said Ellie the only time I would really and I'm not trying to be dogmatic about rules but the only time that you really would want something like a carb in isolation would be before you work out because you will utilize that as quick energy for your workout so that's important to note mm -hmm. but if you wanted a banana or berries at a snack or a meal oatmeal is a pretty high in fiber source. So you could do oatmeal with some protein powder mixed in and then slice up a banana. And then you have a high fiber option with your oatmeal. You have your fruit with your banana and then you have protein powder mixed in. So you kind of have a full meal with something that you could still enjoy your banana. Right. Or even like Greek yogurt. Mom, you sent me a, a video of someone that did Greek yogurt with berries in it, right? That mm -hmm. would be a way to do fiber in the berries and then protein in the Greek yogurt and you're still getting the fruit, right? Same thing with cottage cheese. They sell those individual cottage cheese things. So like there's ways to pair a carb with a protein where it doesn't sound bad, right? And I it's forgot, I, I totally forgot about protein powder. I'd put that in all my smoothies. So whether it's a banana or, or whatever. With protein powders and sauces and things like Gina and I are not legalistic, but with someone like my dad, who's going to have to do some, some very, he's going to need to dial his nutrition in for about three months. And then he can maybe become a little less dogmatic with it. But with things like protein powder, you know, look at the sugar content on protein powders, because oh. don't trust the food industry to have your best interest at heart. Like a lot of times there's protein powders that have upwards of 10 to even 17 grams of sugar, added sugar. So find a really clean protein powder. Don't just assume that everything is good in that, in that protein source. And then same thing with like sauces. This happened yesterday when we went to sushi. And, and again, like we're not trying to, the education is such an important part of this. I'm not trying to like rat on my dad. He is the best sport. So like, he, he really, he's a good sport. He would be totally fine with us saying this, but like, it's just an education thing. Like he didn't know that, you know, the sauce that he was putting on his sushi was loaded with, you know, fat and sugar. And it's like, it was yum, yum sauce. 
Yeah. And a lot of yum yum doesn't have a ton of sugar, but that specific one did. So yeah, it's just like, yeah. you just have to, it's an education of like, all right, let's try to eat as, as natural food as, as whole foods as possible. And then be careful with the sauces and the supplements, like the protein powders and stuff like that. Cause the sugar really adds up. Could you include in the, the show notes, or maybe we can do a, a supplemental pod podcast, how to read a label because y'all understand that, but I'm sitting here thinking, I did not know what, what Gina said, that there were two types of sugars. Can you, help help us know how to do that especially in context of the the diabetes issue it's in our course we have a whole thing okay. about that but gina can you share a little bit about because you you did this in the course specifically but when there there's fiber in a food right and how that plays into the the carbs oh, net carbs net carbs so, and that's one of the reasons why eliminating carbs completely is something that we just don't recommend really for anyone, because if you eliminate carbs completely, you don't get fiber because fiber is a subcomponent of a carb. So when I was talking about total carbs, and then we had that category of sugar and then included sugar, and then fiber will also be listed underneath carbs because all of those are types of carbs, but fiber is a type of carbohydrate that we cannot digest. And so it gets passed through our digestive tract. And there's really two main types. They're soluble and insoluble. And this is, it's, it can get a little confusing and that's why it's in our course and you have worksheets and things to fill out. But essentially this, the whole gut bacteria rage right now that everyone talks about really does come back to fiber. And so with fiber, when you eat soluble fiber, you essentially break that down inside of your gut to feed your gut bacteria. So it's really, it's a cool process where people talk about prebiotics. Well, that's what soluble fiber is. When you digest it, when it breaks down in your gut, you actually utilize that to feed your healthy gut bacteria. So that's one of the, the really cool components about fiber and why we don't want to completely eliminate carbs, because if you do that, you're not getting the benefits of fiber, which is so important for health and longevity. But if you look at a food label, if you've ever seen a package that's branded as net carbs or keto or something of that nature, I know a lot of the low carb tortillas do this is let's say it's 20 total carbs. If there's 10 grams of fiber, they will take 20 carbs, subtract the 10. And so there would be 10 net carbs because essentially mm -hmm. you don't digest it. So you're not really getting the calories out of that fiber. Soluble fiber you do, but it's not 100%. So anyway, not to get too confusing, yeah. but that's really what net carbs comes down to is they just subtract the fiber from the total carbs. How to keep it really like stupid simple for someone like my dad, I'm going to tell him, hey, you don't have to eliminate carbs, but we're going to choose carbs that are very high in fiber. So for example, if he normally ate white rice with fish at a meal or brown rice, even mm -hmm. there's really not a big difference between brown and white rice. What I'm going to suggest is, hey, let's replace that rice, for example, with something like even a sweet potato or beans. Beans are incredibly high in fiber, right? It's a great carb source. They even have a little bit of plant-based protein. He doesn't even, if he doesn't want a carb, we can maybe put in an avocado. That actually has a ton of fiber. So it's a fat source, but the name of the game is going to be, how can we keep him from being super hungry? Because what's going to happen is this started because I love my dad, but like he'll skip, you know, a meal and he'll go eight hours without eating. And so he's starving by the end of the day, duh, I would be too. So what are we going to reach for when we're starving? The easy to digest, the highly palatable, high sugar, high carb type options that we can get really quickly. And so if, if you're taking out carbs from his meals and he's not replacing that with even like a high, a healthy fat or even more protein, he's going to be hungry and it's going to make this process really hard. And he's going to be relying on willpower. So, which we know is not sustainable. Does that kind of make sense of like hot, like yes. non-starchy carbs, high fiber carbs? Yes. And Ellie, I wanted to tell you, or just tell everyone, I guess the really simple trick that I have for identifying a food yes. label that is considered a high fiber source of carbs mm -hmm. is if you look at the total fiber, let's say it's three grams of fiber, add a zero to that. So it says 30. If that number is greater than the total carbs in the food, you know, you have a high fiber source. So like for breads, if you're trying to pick out a bread, which one is a good fiber source, what one will, you know, keep me feeling fuller for longer, just go to the total fiber, add your zero, and then make sure that number is greater than the total carb. So just a really simple trick you can do on the fly. So, and is there a way, okay, because Ellie, you just said 
brown rice versus a sweet a sweet potato versus brown rice. I would have no way of knowing that. How do you know that that's a better choice? How do you know quinoa is the same? I mean, how do we know? Do y'all have a list? We do have a list of high fiber foods, but also like that would be looking at food labels. If you don't have a food label like a sweet potato, truly, it sounds super silly, but a quick Google search, like how much fiber is in a sweet potato, and it will pop up right away. But most like quinoa, you just have to look at the food labels, put up the brown rice, put up the quinoa, see what the fiber content is in both of them. Oh, you're saying choose the one carb at your dinner, choose the carb with the highest fiber. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So it's not better or worse. It's just which has the highest fiber, which will not retain as many carbs. So, so, and, and this is kind of confusing. This is like, again, why it's helpful to work with a coach. You can help you because it's yeah. not yeah. super black and white. Here's the thing. So like a sweet potato has four grams of fiber on average at face value. You're going to be like, that's nothing. That that's absolutely nothing. But the total amount of fiber that even the American Heart Association recommends for males is like 38 grams per day. And females, I want to say is like 31 ish or 32. Gina, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, four grams out of 30 is actually like, like you're adding it up, right? That's not, I mean, you only, that's one eighth, right? So like if you eat at each meal, you try to get, you know, eight grams of fiber and then at snacks, you try to get five. I mean, you're above your goal like that. I think just think, okay, when you Google sweet potato, you're going to see four grams and you might be tempted to be like, oh, that's nothing. But it's actually, it is Mm -hmm. a a bit. Yes, the fiber is important to look at, like the total amount of grams, but also educating yourself on the difference between a starchy carb and a non-starchy carb. Non-starchy carbs are going to be a lot of like veggies specifically, right? So like veggies have carbs. Like if you eat carrots, they're going to have carbs, but those are going to take a long time for your body to to digest and break down. So like, here's a little simple trick. Let's say your carb for dad is going to be a sweet potato. What if you threw in with that sweet potato, like you roasted some, some you did half the sweet potato and roasted some carrots or in, in a big thing of like broccoli and, and you did like half starchy carbs, half non-starchy carbs and you you just like throw all that on a plate. It's going to be a lot of volume because you're going to have a ton of veggies. He's going to get full on that. And and then you're not eliminating a carb, but he's still having like a high quality carb source. So that's just like one little substitution that you can think through, but it's more so just like the the tip that I'm going to tell my dad is like, Hey, look on your plate, identify the carb. Do you only have one? And what type of carb is it? Right. Is it, does it have fiber? Um, and is it, is, is it only one starchy? So we can have one carb and that might be a slice of sourdough. It might be rice. It might, but it's not going to be rice and a slice of sourdough. Right. That's an easy okay. way to like eliminate. Yeah. And it's going to be paired with a protein and hopefully a veggie, which keeps your blood sugar from just shooting up um, and you being like starving afterwards. So, and that's yeah. where and the infographic of the plate method is super helpful. I don't yes. know if we can like link to that somewhere in the show notes of like yes, the plate method, but Essentially, like if you picture a standard dinner plate, a quarter of that should be your protein source. So it's like about the size of your palm, a quarter of your plate is filled up with your protein. And right underneath of that, the bottom quarter is your carbohydrate. So your potato, your rice, your piece of sourdough, and then half of the plate should be some type of a non-starchy carb, like your vegetable. So that could be roasted zucchini and onions. It could be slivered Brussels sprouts, whatever you want it to be. But half of that plate should be some type of a vegetable. So it's a really easy way to picture your plate. And then we've talked about fats a little bit. A lot of times you will roast veggies with some olive oil or put a little butter on your sourdough. And if you're doing that, you don't have to worry about adding in an intentional fat source because you're already cooking with it or putting it on your carb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like for dad, I'd be careful though, because like I said about, we want to get a lot of volume in without a lot of like food volume, without a ton of like calories from carbs. So like, if you do a slice of butter on sourdough, let's be honest, that's not going to fill him up a lot. Right. So while he's working really hard to, you know, lose some weight and make lifestyle changes, I would suggest we choose the really filling carbs, like a sweet potato, because mom, correct me if I'm wrong, like no one really, not many people are going to be able to eat more than one sweet potato because it's very filling. It's very high on the satiety index. So you want to be wise about the food you choose. Rice, for example, if I go to Tzatziki's and get a bowl of rice, that's about this big. That does nothing for me. That doesn't fill me up as much as the potatoes do. So you want to be wise about what you choose 
um, as well. So like maybe for sourdough for dad for a while, unless he just really wants that and he's not super hungry, I would say let's substitute that with a more filling carb. But okay. then the one thing I want to circle back to that we didn't even hit on is like, what's the lowest hanging fruit? Like for, for dad, I'm like, dad, how many sodas do you drink a week? And he was like, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, like probably like, you know, three, you don't even have to make these nutritional changes yet. As, as crazy as that sounds, if dad alone cut out the sodas, which I, we're not for completely eliminating everything. Like if you want to have alcohol, you don't have to completely eliminate it from your diet. But like with, with sugary sodas, if you cut that out alone, his blood sugar would go down. You and know? I ask y'all a question. I know, I know that the diet sodas are not healthy, but if you are drinking three diet sodas and you're just going to wean into getting off that sugar, can you go from Coke to Coke zero just for that sugar correction and be okay? Or does the fact that it stimulates whatever it does to mimic? I mean, because y'all, some people are going to be grasping for whatever. They're accustomed to that Coke. Can they just switch it for a Diet Coke? Um, I'm going to say yes, because yeah. again, you're not going to have that huge blood sugar spike from drinking a soda. The only time I would say this is becoming an issue is if you're sacrificing water intake for the sake yeah. of having a Diet Soda or whatever the case is. So if that means... We're swapping out a Coke for a Coke Zero. I am 1000% in favor of that as long as water intake is sufficient for the person. I agree. Like, yes, you could make a case for diet drinks, probably making you crave more sugar, even though you're not intaking sugar. Your body thinks about it in the same way of like cocaine, right? You know, we, we crave more sugar when we drink diet drinks, whatever, whether that's true or not. If someone can substitute a diet drink for a sugary soda, please do it. And then from there, once they do that for a while and they see the positive changes, maybe they substitute that for, you know, a Zevia or or mm -hmm. a little bit of like a poppy or a, a seltzer water or something that's maybe better every Fine. single day. But if Fine. that weans you off of sodas, oh my gosh, yes, I would okay. say. Well, anything else? I, I will say that just last night, he's already, just from our phone conversations, Ellie, with some tips... Um, on the way home from Auburn, we stopped at Burger King. We were starving. We both got a Whopper, no cheese and no fries. And your dad, I remember you told him fries because he would always get fries. He didn't get them. And that was a win. So I'm trying to praise him for the wins because it's hard. It's hard. You know, you feel restricted, but just the simple wins, I think, will help encourage people to keep at it. One piece of advice for the activity side of things. Yes. Important. And, yeah. and obviously strength training is awesome and we believe everyone should be doing it, but walking after meals can have a huge oh. impact on sugar because you utilize glucose without insulin. So essentially going for a five, 10, 15 minute walk after your meals will actually help your muscles utilize the glucose versus it just sitting in your bloodstream, which is huge for, for really for anyone. So we always encourage we know every single meal that's probably not feasible, but even if it was after dinner time, instead of just sitting on the couch and hanging out, you said, let's go for a five or 10 minute walk. That would do wonders for blood sugar. <laughs> yeah, because now I'm going to tell you, you know how that's so powerful yeah. and dads like this too. And I bet a lot of people are, I'm an all or nothing. And if I can't walk my route that's 10,000 steps. It's like, oh, I missed it today. I'll walk another day. Walking has to be the loop all around that takes 30 minutes or it's not worth anything. Yeah. People think a five minute walk is just nothing. That, that I was sitting there thinking, you are kidding me. Because I see people, they're always walking first thing in the morning. So yeah. you're saying the best walk is after you eat. For blood sugar purposes. For, it, for blood sugar. Yeah. 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 And I tell people five minutes that can get you, let's say it's a thousand steps. If you did that once a day for a week, you walked 7,000 steps, which is over three miles. And then you multiply that by the end of the year. And it, so it's just these little things that truly add up. I mean, you're over, you're close to 200 miles by the end of the year, if you did a five minute walk every day. And yeah. so it sounds so silly and I, hey, I'm just going to skip it, but there's just so much power in those little things. If you can do them consistently on a daily basis. Yeah. 
And Gina, like, I, oh my gosh, that is so important. Like, even if it's just five minutes, like keeping that chain of walking after dinner, not having this in your head, if it has to be 10 or 15, obviously that's ideal if you can, but if you're about, if you're tired and you are ready, you're ready to go to bed and take a shower, like go for five minutes, like, you know, and that still helps. And that's, yeah, I just think positive habits breed positive habits. So if you mm-hmm. know that, Hey, that's just what you do. You go on a walk after dinner. Is that going to make you not gorge yourself at dinner knowing you have a walk coming up and you don't want a lot of food sloshing around in your stomach? Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's like positive habits affect all the other habits. So I just love that. And I think that's the best, that best tip of the podcast. So yeah. Well, guys, this this is so helpful. So, so helpful. And I know I need to take the course compl- in completion <laughs> to get all of this, you know, because you have, sort of have to let it sink in and then go go revisit it. But are there any other things that you want to share? Because I feel like we've covered so much. A little bit of water. Make sure you're drinking a lot of water so that you're not actually hungry instead of thirsty. When You, you can mistake those things. Right. Um, walking a ton. And then as far as just like fitness, Gina already hit on it. Resistance training is outstanding. Obviously, we want to do that like at a minimum three times per week. But some type of cardio regimen, just because you, you and Gina, you ha- can have more to say on this than me, but you he is going to need you know, some type of fitness modality to get his heart rate up and um, get in that cardiovascular training. So y'all are the best. Thank you. And um, would y'all leave all the, I'm going to leave all the information regarding your course for women um, and how to get in touch with you. I'll leave all of that in the show notes, as well as all these tips that you shared. I'm just going to say shout out to dad for letting us talk about him. Like, I hope people don't I hope people don't think that we're like bashing him. He is, he gave us full permission to do this. Yes, He's yes. ready to make a change and he is the best sport. And we're just so proud of him for being willing to yes. make it. And just I know like- that I feel sure we're going to be coming back even before three months. Cause he's so competitive. Hey, you, he'll have this down and he's probably going to compete with your other client who really dropped. He's probably going to, <laughs> go. he's going to want to be the one you shout out next time. Yes, so and he, will be. he will be. Okay. Okay, ladies, thank you so, so much. And y'all can always come back anytime. And to all watching or listening, until next time, you have a fabulous rest of your day. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Cast. If you'll take the time to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, that would mean so much. As always, thank you for listening and have a blessed day.